Hello, sculpture students. Um, in this demonstration, we are going to be working with a few of your materials that I've, I've provided for you. Um, again, if you didn't pick up a kit from the studio, uh, you can always just use um, things that you have laying around your um, garage or something like that. Um, but what we're going to be doing today, or, or the tools that you are going to be needing today, okay, is going to be your round circle bat. Okay, we're going to use this for a, quite a bit of things. I did put some screws in some of uh, your kit's um, uh, round bat. So go ahead and grab a screwdriver, take those screws out. Keep those screws because we're going to need to uh, use those later on for another assignment to anchor some wire down. We don't need that today. Go ahead and take the screws off and make sure you just have a nice, flat, clean bat. Okay? So you can just use this as, use this as a small tabletop or a small sculpture uh, uh, stand uh, when you are working on your assignments. Um, you're also going to need your plaster. Um, I have a smaller container than what I provided for some of you, um, but that's going to be plenty. Okay, so make sure you have a nice, good, clean uh, area of your plaster. Um, you're going to also need your, um, uh, your clay here, and you can see how I got about a five-pound ball clay and about a two-pound ball clay. So just uh, cut uh, with your wire tool, okay, a nice cube like we did last demonstration, and just cut that cube in half so you have a nice smaller cube or, 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 or round form, okay? Um, don't need a lot of clay, but just a little bit for today. You're going to need your wooden knife, all right, and you're going to need your... Um, square rib, okay? Um, <laughs> you're also going to need your uh, two uh, measurement containers that I provided you. Um, if you don't have these, um, try to just use a nice good maybe plastic Tupperware or a yogurt container that's somewhat similar to about a quart, okay? I think they sell yogurt containers in a quart, um, so that will work just fine, but you're going to need two of them, okay? Um, and those are the materials that we're going to be uh, using today. Oh, and one more thing. You are going to need your canvas board that I provided you. Uh, that's for later on in the process. Um, if you don't have a canvas board, just a nice good sheet of uh, maybe a plywood um, or um, something that you can work with some clay on and, and, and compress clay onto. Uh, we don't want to use a glass table or even like a fine lacquered finish um, a wood piece of furniture because that will probably uh, uh, scar the surface because... Uh, these are um, hard particles that are in here, and it will scratch a lot of things. So, okay, uh, make sure you have all of these materials, and let's learn how to mix plaster. We're also going to learn how to play with texture and pattern, okay, in order to achieve good detail with what's called a plaster cast, okay? So our objective today is to learn how to mix plaster properly so plaster can get hard. We're going to be using plaster a lot in the later on uh, assignments and processes, okay? We're also going to learn how to work with a uh, pattern, right? And learn how to cast plaster in order to achieve detail. And all this is going to make sense uh, when we are going to be doing uh, the demonstration. Okay, so after you um, have found a place that you can do this assignment, uh, we're going to be putting a little bit of compression and pounding onto or your ball of clay onto your small bat here or your round bat. So make sure you have a table that's nice and sturdy. Okay, again, you can always do this on the floor if you don't have a sturdy enough table. But the first thing that we're going to do is, as always, I want you to compress nicely that ball into an orb. Okay, so we can definitely get a nice surface, and don't forget about that, okay? Um, you don't want to um, ever work with just a block of clay. You always want to round it out, and that's going to help you, again, achieve a good surface, because we're going to need to put um, some pattern on the surface of this clay here after we finish doing a compressed slab. Um, but So we need that surface to be as clean as possible, so I'm going to try my best to get rid of a lot of the um, wrinkling, and things that occur again when we're compressing. Okay, now after you're done with that, I want you to place that into the center of your round uh, sculpture stand and I want you to start to compress down. Keep that ball of clay nice and round because we're going to be making a nice small round slab. Okay, almost a concave shaped slab. All right, and you're gonna see. Okay, so I'm gonna hit that with my nice, um, strong, soft part here of my palm. I'm gonna lock that wrist, and I'm gonna try to move it out into a spiral. 
If that's going off center, I'm gonna kind of move that into the center to make sure I keep this center. Again, I'm gonna hit the center of that ball of clay and gently pad out in a spiral formation. Again, I'm gonna keep doing that. Now, if you can see, as I go for the profile, how I have a good thickness that I'm maintaining in the center, and it's kind of a tapering down, almost like a what's called a concave shape. So we're going to make kind of a, a nice curved shape with some thickness in the center. All right, we want that thickness. We don't want this to be just like a flat cookie. Okay, we want some thickness or some roundness to that tip or to that edge. Okay, I'm going to keep going in a, in a spiral. Hit that center. Don't hit that center too hard because remember we want to keep some thickness and we're going to go around real easily. Okay, I'll turn it sideways again. You can see how I'm maintaining a thicker center. I'm going to keep going. And as I keep going, I'm going to lay off it a little bit so I'm not applying so much pressure, but I'm more so just making sure that the surface is treated nicely, right? Again, you can see how cleaner that form is getting, and it's trying to get that angle prop. There it is, you see? A little thick in the center, tapering down thinner on the edge. Again, I really want you to work on that to make sure that that is proper as perfectly round as you can get it, and of course as clean of a surface that we can um, uh, provide ourselves for some good imprintation. Again, what we're working with today is texture, right, maybe some pattern, okay, and we're going to be working with the aspect of positive and negative, and we're going to sh I'm going to show you that in a bit. But first, like a lot of things that we're going to be having to do with our assignments is prep the material. Okay, you have to prep things before you start to have fun and be creative with it. And that also allows us time to reset. You know, sometimes it's you, you know, you're in traffic and, or you got responsibilities at home that you gotta take care of. Sometimes just prepping your art is gonna help you filter out a lot of those stresses and allow you to get ready to be creative. Okay, so get used to some prep work. Okay, even though what we're doing here is not the creative part, it's still important and it still can support the creativity. Okay, there we go, nice. Okay, so you see how I'm now just using the nice kind of softer part here just to slowly shape and make sure that surface is as clean as possible. There we go. Okay, so you see how I maintain a certain level of thickness in that center and I've tapered down to a nice, right, convex. And that's the word, is a convex shape, okay? Concave would be the opposite, negative of that, but a convex is a nice, good slope downward, okay? It's not a half orb. Make sure you don't do a half sphere. It's almost like the very top of the sphere, almost like if you just take a laser beam and slice off the very top of the moon, right? You get this cap, right, a convex. Okay, very good. Now make sure you work that out real nicely. Okay. And again, very important, maintain a thickness at the top. Right, so we have that shape. Now mine got a little off, but that's fine. Okay, again, try to make it as even as possible. Remember, we're only working on the top part of your round sculpture stand, not the bottom part for now. Okay. Okay, so I zoomed in a little bit um, to give you guys a little bit more of a sense of the detail that we're gonna be working with here. Um, what I want everybody to do though, before we start, um, is to go into the junk drawer, go into the garage outside, um, and I want you to find something rigid, okay, that is an organic shape. And right here you can see that I have a seashell um, that um, I like the pattern. Um, and that's a really good example of an organic shape. Uh, you could find a cool river stone, um, maybe a cool small branch, a fossil you might have 
uh, laying around. Just make sure that you can press it into clay and it's not going to damage what you have. Um, and make sure it's not something soft like a stuffed animal, but a toy that's organically shaped. Okay, remember organic means that there's really no angles or ridges or, or you know, mechanically um, formed um, shapes, right? Um, a seashell is a good example. Um, now, after you found a good um, um, organic shape, I want you to find a nice uh, geometric shape of some sort, uh, maybe a tool, a piece of jewelry. Um, here, uh, we do a lot of 3D printing and sculpture, um, so we have um, these 3D printed little forms that we made a while back, these dice. Um, so, you know, a uh, pretty easy example, but I want you to find something around so we can make some interesting pattern so we can learn how to achieve detail and mix plaster. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do here. I'm going to um, make a design of some sort with my two uh, uh, objects here simply by imprinting. And I want you to think about pattern. I want you to think about, you know, shape. Um, and just have some fun, okay? There's really nothing that uh, can go wrong here. Um, if you don't like your uh, pattern that you imprint on, you can always just uh, take the clay off, ball it up nicely, do the whole process all over again and start again, okay? So, um, and I'm going to uh, see if I can uh, just do a simple design that can, you know, um, intertwine both these shapes, the geometric and then the organic shape. Um, so, I'm just gonna start off, okay, with the simple pattern here. Um, so I'm gonna easily just start to imprint down nicely. And the reason why we have that thickness, remember the concave thickness that we have, okay? I'm sorry, the convex thickness is so we can get good shadow. So the deeper you go, the more that light is gonna break over the edge of that um, clay, right? Remember that last uh, demonstration we worked on. Okay, I'm gonna try it again. Ooh, interesting. Okay, got a little bit of peak there from that negative space. I don't know if I want to keep that. I'm going to turn that around, okay, and just do it again. Again, just simply making a pattern. And what we're going to be doing is, is trying to capture this pattern. Okay, I'm going to go straight down the center, one half organic, one half mechanical or geometric. Again, you can do whatever you want. It doesn't really, um, remember, it's your pattern. It's going to be your, what we call a relief, okay? A relief is a three-dimensional form in set in a two-dimensional plane. Okay, I'm gonna turn that to this side so maybe we can get a little bit more of that detail that I'm working with. And what you can see, I'll zoom in a hair, um, you can see what's nice about clay, right, is that those platelet structures that we were talking about, all those little um, sheets of glass are going into all the negative spaces, all the detail of that seashell, creating that perfect imprint. Right, and clay is, is interesting because it's one of the you know, few materials that can really do this, right? And we can fire this and maintain that exact detail, right? We, it, can, it can last forever, basically. I'm gonna continue on here. And like I said, just have fun with it. Um, you could even use maybe some parts of your fingertips to get some actual personal, uh, 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 person, your own personal shape in there. Um, but remember, you do must have one organic shape and at least one geometric shape. So we can really play with that shape, play with that pattern, okay? I'm gonna do it again over here. I'm gonna stagger it a little bit, just making some simple design um, choices here. Again, what's really important here is that we learn how to mix plaster and we learn how to uh, achieve this detail. And this is ultimate detail. That clay is capturing everything that that fossil or that shell is touching, okay? And our goal here is to try to achieve all of that detail with our process, okay? Over here, I'm gonna do a little bit more design choice. I'm not gonna go all the way down, but I think I could use a little bit more shadow here, okay? And remember, it's always good to have like a nice good spotlight or a lamp so you can really see the shadows play when you see that. Now look at that. See, there's a lot of good stuff happening there with the shadows and the movement, okay? But what we're dealing with here, okay, is a positive, right? In this case, the positive is going to be the seashell, and we're imprinting it into the, to achieve a negative, right? So a positive and a negative. And a lot of what we're gonna be doing is called mold making, making the mold of a sculpture of some sort. A lot of that has to deal with the aspect of the positive and negative, right? Um, so in order for us to achieve that cast, meaning that casting is defined at, 
as material that we pour into a negative space, in this case it will be our plaster, right? Right? We're going to be casting plaster into that negative space, letting that plaster harden, right, to see if we achieve the full detail. Basically a plaster cast of your right form. And this is a simple way of doing it. It's a flat way of doing it, but it really is going to show us how to work with plaster properly. I'm going to continue on with my geometric shape here, okay? Going to see how that looks. And every time I do this, it's, it's definitely an experiment, no matter how many times, right? Because what's going to happen is that it's going to look completely different. Right now we're seeing the negative space, right, of that shell. It's going to look completely different when we get the positive cast out of that plaster that we're going to be using in a bit. Okay. And it's going to look different not only because, you know, um, there's a multiple of them. It's going to look different because... It's going to be in another material, plaster. We're all used to seeing seashells in, in their natural state, but when you see a glass seashell or a plaster seashell like we're going to have, it has a different effect on the viewer. What that's called in sculpture is the, is the psychological aspect of materials. Right? Everybody is going to, has a different psychological reaction to material. Right? You react differently to wood than you do to gold. Right? You react differently uh, from plastic than you do clay, right? Um, might be unintentional, but it is psychologically happening whenever we are in front of certain types of material. Okay, you can see how that's looking pretty interesting. I'm really liking that pattern, okay? I really hope you guys have fun too. Remember, this is just make sure that we're, we're, we're understanding basic principles of positive and negative. Okay, I'm going to continue on. Okay, maybe just one more on that little area and I am done. Okay, I'm going to zoom out a hair. Okay, there we go. And lift it up a bit. And I want you to do the same thing. You know, I really want you to uh, analyze every uh, shadow, right, and spin it, take it out to the sunlight and, and spin it around to really analyze the way that that light is breaking and, 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 and to kind of think about are there any possibilities with, uh, with these types of processes. I mean, you can see this multiplied 20 times on a wall for an interesting, right, pattern or surface. Okay. Go ahead and have fun. Again, if you don't like what you've uh, uh, imprinted, you can always take the clay off, ball it up nicely. You've got to ball it up really well because you've added a lot of texture, so you've got to really compress it and then start all over again. And then we'll move on to the next step. All right, now um, I've moved on to my canvas board here, okay? Um, so make sure you have a good space for that. Uh, and remember, your canvas board should always be clean. After you use it, you should always use a nice damp sponge to to um, scrape it down or to um, wipe it down. And we only want to ever use our wooden knife, okay, or our wooden um, scraper or rib tool, okay, um, to clean this uh, board here. So, um, for instance, like the, this rib tool here. Uh, we don't want to cut this canvas, okay, um, because um, it, 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 uh, these are part of the Sculpture Studios equipment, so we want to make sure we take care of them. But working on ca canvas is a great way to work with clay because you can compress it, you can roll it around, and that canvas will not uh, uh, let that clay stick to it. All right, so let's move on. Um, now, after you've uh, done your imprinting of your uh, pattern on your uh, convex clay form, uh, you're going to grab your smaller ball of clay. Remember, you're supposed to have two balls of clay, one five pound and one little two pound ball of clay, okay? And that's, you know, if you see that scale there, okay, probably the size of a little small crab apple of something, okay? And what we're going to be making is called a fence, right? And that's going to be a term that we're going to be using later on, right, uh, for different processes. So uh, let's start off with first, okay, making sure that we are Got that orb nice and clean and compressed, okay? And I want you to squeeze it. See how I'm squeezing it and rotating it as I squeeze. Okay, spin it around and rotate it as you squeeze, okay? Don't squeeze it too hard because we don't want that clay to crack, but what we need is a what's called a coil, all right? Squeezing that all the way down to a coil, 
which is almost like a, a snake of clay. Okay, that's the easiest way to get started is to coil that around. That's a good probably, you know, maybe a good, um, you know, inch or so thick, okay? Now, after you're done with that, make sure you have all your tools out of the way. And this is what's nice about a canvas board. It allows us to make nice coils so that we can use as fence lines. And you'll see in a bit what I'm talking about. I want you to start on the tip of that, I mean, the center of that coil, right? And with just the weight of your arm or the weight of both of your arms in your hand, just roll it all the way to the wrist and back, okay? You're not really putting a lot of pressure because we don't want our coils to be flat. So we want them to be nice and round. They shouldn't flop around and have a flat spot. And that's achieved by starting in the center, right? And working your way out. Again, center, work your way out. Okay, now I've rolled that out, okay, to again, maybe about a quarter inch thick, okay, of a, okay, not too thin, all right? Only did that a little bit in order to create a nice good snake, okay? I want you to lift that corner up, right? And I, with the nice soft part of your hand here, you're gonna do kind of a, kind of a, kind of a chopping uh, move here. Use that nice part of your hand, not the bone area, but the nice soft part, I'm going to lift that up, right, and gently tap that down, okay? Again, I'm going to lift that up and gently flatten one side all the way down. You see that? How that's turned into now a almost a wall or a fence, okay, that's what it's called. I'm going to turn that around so I get the other side complete, gently tap, okay? Now you can see how that thickness here, okay, still a little thick for me, so I'm gonna do it one more time. And when we lift up, that's gonna help it move. So that's important to lift all the way up. But we don't wanna make it too thin because we don't want that wall to collapse. All the way down, back here. Just like so, okay? After you do that, okay, I want you to tap it. See how I'm standing it up on its side? Okay, I want you to just tap it down. Turn around, tap it down just a bit like this. See that? And I'm kind of squaring off that edge here. So focus. Squaring off that edge so we have a nice, almost like a ribbon, right, of clay. Real simple way to make what we call a fence line. Okay, um, after you get done with that, make sure that your fence line is smooth. If it gets really rough there, you can always use your flat rib here. Do just a slight compressing here. Not too much, okay? Again, we don't want to weaken that. We need that to maintain some amount of thickness. If that's too thin, the plaster will leak. And you're gonna see why in a bit, okay? So, very simple. Make a nice good fence line, okay? Make sure it's about, about quarter inch to a half inch thick, and very important. Look at the height of that. I'm gonna put that in comparison to your rib tool. See that? Look at the thickness, that's a good inch. Solid inch, maybe an inch and a quarter. Make sure it's thick, we don't want it thin. We don't want it a half inch, we want it a nice good solid width along with a thickness, all right? And that's how you make a good fence line and we're gonna use that technique in other processes later on. Okay, now going back to your um, uh, pattern here, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to uh, begin to attach the fence to make almost like a container, okay, of your form. Now, um, I'm going to go ahead and you're going to have to compress it onto some of this clay in order for that clay to stick to each other. So I'm going to go in, okay, a good maybe quarter inch or so. So that fence line is going to have to stick onto the edge of that clay. So I want you to grab it, okay, and just gently tap it in. See, I'm gently kind of squeezing it in, compressing it onto that clay form. Now, I know this assignment seems pretty simple, but make sure that you have a good space and, 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 and good um, um, concentration because even though it looks simple, it, you know, it, it still is involved and in order to make a nice good, what we call a relief, okay, um, and the relief, again, remember, is a three-dimensional image inset into a two-dimensional plane. We see it a lot in, like, architecture and, you know, a lot of interior design, 
Um, and that's a simple way of, uh, of explaining it is just a two-dimensional, I mean a three-dimensional image in set in a two-dimensional, uh, on a two-dimensional plane. And you can see how I'm doing a little bit of compressing, a little bit of squeezing, shaping that uh, fence line circle. Okay, doesn't have to be perfect. More importantly is that that height here is a little bit higher than the tip. That's why I don't want to, we don't want a dome or a half orb. That little convex curve shape will be plenty, okay? Plenty thick for some texture, but also low enough that your fence line, right, covers it completely. Now, what I'm doing here, okay, is I'm, um, I'm kind of looking through some areas here, making sure I have no light showing, because I don't want plaster to leak. So here's where your tool comes in to do a little bit of kind of a, a little bit of a patching here, okay, in areas that you might need that, that we don't want that clay to leak. And you don't want to touch this stuff. You want all that detail, all that natural movement there. And, and because that's really what we, we enjoy to, see, uh, to look at when you go to the museum, right? I mean, when you go to see a Van Gogh or Michelangelo or Diego Rivera, right, or any type of artist that you like, and when you see like the handprint or you see like a little mark of the clay being moved, that, that gives some connection to that uh, piece of sculpture. Um, so it does allow uh, uh, the viewer to almost feel like they're close to the artist, almost like they're in the studio. So that's why we're doing this assignment is whenever you are sculpting your clay, how do we keep all that movement, the art of the clay, when we later turn it into glass or bronze or, or like we're doing today with plaster? Okay, so again, this technique here is allowing us to learn two things, okay? Pattern, texture, okay? How do we develop quick pattern with found objects, okay? Um, how to mix plaster properly, strongly, so every time we mix plaster, it's gonna work the same way and we know it's going to cure properly, okay? And also, how do we achieve a good cast that has all the detail that we need, okay? And those are the things that we're working with. Now, I'm gonna make sure also that I'm going to make sure the bottom here is compressed nicely. And you can just do that by doing a little bit of, you know, maybe scraping down with your uh, thumb tool here, just to kind of seal off that edge. You can even use your finger, okay, to kind of a, what we call a pie crust that around it on my thumb. See, I'm spreading that around. Just making sure that no plaster is going to leak from the bottom. Because plaster is very heavy. Right, because we're going to add water to plaster, so it's going to be even heavier. So it will break through these clay fences because the plaster is wet, so it's weakening the, pla uh, the the clay wall, right? And it's going to stay wet for a little while, and within that time frame before the plaster is going to cure, right? We don't want it to collapse the fence line or the wall. Again, all this is going to make sense, or or all this is going to be useful when we do later on uh, uh, other processes. Okay, very good. Okay, so next step, make sure you attach your fence line. Okay, make sure you are careful not to damage any of your texture. Okay, and also make sure that your bottom of your fence line is sealed so no plaster leaks through. Okay, so on to plaster now. Um, so you should have your uh, small a container of plaster. I gave you kind of a three-quart container, or um, but you can go ahead and just put that next to you on your table. And you want to get your uh, uh, quart cups that I have provided you with the measuring cup. Again, if you don't have the uh, a measuring or, or, or a, a quart cup with measurements, just go ahead and use a quart yogurt cup or just something similar. But you're going to want to fill it halfway with water. Now you see how I have it here marked at half liter. Okay. Um, uh, and try to get that correct at least halfway. And with your second um, uh, quart cup here, just go ahead and fill it with water almost halfway. That's really just going to be simply for when we mix. Uh, we can put your wooden spoon that you're going to use to mix, or your wooden uh, um, or your wooden thumb tool, either or. In order to mix that plaster, when we're done mixing, we can dump that into the water so it doesn't harden or ruin our our, our tool or so we don't have to scrape it off, okay? So that's all that is, really just uh, having some water available. Always have a little bit of clay available next to you in case there is any leaking um, on your uh, 
uh, clay for form, um, and, and we can use that to use to plug up. Now, plaster, okay, is a very beautiful material. Okay, now all plaster really is 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 um, calcium carbonate. Um, which is prehistoric seashells, basically, that have been uh, aged. And, of course, this planet was at one point populated by nothing but shelled creatures. Uh, when they uh, uh, moved on and evolution moved on, those uh, large, large amounts of calcium carbonate shells were placed in different pockets of the planet where we then get plaster, okay? And there's really nothing else in plaster but that calcium carbonate uh, particle or just organic seashells and that's what's beautiful about plaster is that there's no added catalyst or chemical reaction it's just a physical reaction of what happens when you do it when you put a particle of plaster or or calcium carbonate into water it kind of pops like popcorn grabbing onto each other each other right and that what makes plaster um, hard is the fact that it's reacting, a molecule of calcium carbonate is reacting to a molecule of water or HTO, creating a physical reaction, allowing it to bind. Very similar almost to what happens when you fire clay, except instead of water, it's fire that's making that uh, physical reaction. That silica little platelet that we talked about expands into other crystals and grabs onto the other platelets, creating a solid right same things happening with plaster except instead of fire it's water that water is allowing that calcium carbonate particle to expand just like beans right or, or like rice and that grabs onto each other but at a very microscopic uh, level right so there's trillions and trillions upon small little um, particles of calcium carbonate that are going to be exploding and expanding grabbing onto each other and that's why when we mix and this plaster will start to get hard or cured right it will Get warm. You'll, you'll, you'll feel a little bit of heat. That heat is going to uh, let us uh, know what state that plaster is in while it's curing. So that heat that plaster develops as it's curing, and you'll see in a bit, is because of those particles that are reacting to the molecular particles of the water creating again a physical reaction. So real cool stuff, right? Real simple, but cool. Um, now I do want you to have your dust mask uh, on and ready to go, or at least a handkerchief over your uh, face, or uh, make sure you have a good ventilated area that you're in your garage or outside, of course, in a covered area, okay? Uh, plaster is not a toxic material, but you know, you don't want to breathe any dust in if you can help it, okay, at all. Right now, um, plaster is just like rice. It's a 50-50 mix. I have half right amount of water, and I'm going to keep adding plaster to the center of that quart cup until I reach the very top. Right, That's ensuring me that I have a 50-50 mix. Now, that's going to be plenty, right? almost a little bit too much for what we need, but uh, that's okay. I want you to be able to play with the plaster right afterwards to learn the states of plaster. Right, Plaster has a pouring state, it has a detail coat state, and it also has what's called a casting state. Because as you're working with plaster, it's going to cure harder and harder, and it's going to go through these different states of dryness. Right, uh, It's going to start off very wet, then it's going to get kind of milky, then it's going to get kind of like a, um, a, like a melted ice cream, and then all the way to a solid, all within a good five to eight minute time frame. So this is why we want to be very prepared when we do this next step. Make sure that you're not going to be disturbed and make sure that when you are working with the plaster that you are really paying attention to it because one second it could be uh, nice and soft, right? And then about 30 seconds later, real quickly, it can get hard. So you have to really pay attention to that uh, time frame that plaster needs. So I'm going to simply start off by just using my hand. Um, if you want to go ahead and use a, a rubber glove, you have your dish gloves that's in your materials lift. That could work too. Uh, plaster is not toxic to the hand, so it just comes off with water, but you don't want it to dry on your hands, right? And you'll see what I'm talking about in a bit, okay? But I'm just going to place that right in the center, okay, of that uh, quart can. And let me do a little zoom in here so you can see what I'm talking about because we're going to wait until we see a rise almost like a small island forming in the center, okay? And don't go too fast. Allow that plaster to sink in, okay? Allow it to sink in to the surface. I'm going to grab another amount here, okay? Again, you see I'm putting just kind of small little handfuls into that center, okay? I'm going to keep going. And you can see how that quart water line here, that half quart water line is rising, Okay, a little bit more, keep going. I'm gonna keep going 
like I said, until I reach almost all the way to the top, okay, to ensure that I have a 50-50 mix. And keep going. All right, not quite yet. And I really do want you to work with it this way. Don't try to shortcut any of the processes because, like I said, um, it, it seems like a fairly simple assignment, but it can really uh, run away from you pretty fast. Okay, let me keep going. And what's happening is that there's a lot of air inside the dry plaster. So all that air is being compressed out. Keep going almost, but you can see that water level rising. I'm gonna go all the way to the very top just to ensure that I have a proper mix. Now, every time you mix plaster, whether you're doing a quarter of a cup of water, you always mix it the same way, okay? Uh, it always has to be a 50-50 mix. Now we see something happening where we see an island starting to form at the top, right? And that island is kind of collapsing down. That's a good sign. That means that we're almost there, okay? I and mean, you see how it's collapsing, right? That island is forming and collapsing down. I'm going to add another one, okay? And you see how that island starts to, it stops collapsing. And once that a little peak mountain there, right? Little Zen snowy peak mountain. Once that stops collapsing, that's when you know you have enough plaster. So I'm going to wait there a little bit. Okay. And you can see how it's stopped sinking in. And that lets me know that I have a good mix. Okay, I'm going to move that to the side. Okay. Then I'm going to get my wooden spoon. Okay, or get my... um my wooden knife, whatever you have next to you. You can even use a popsicle stick. I want you to put that in there, right, and stir really good. Now, we're not frothing yet. We're not really doing a lot of um, um, uh, any air capture. We don't want that air to be captured inside there. We want less air because that air can create bubbles in our relief that we're doing here. Remember, our whole goal here is to get as much detail as possible. Okay, I'm going to zoom out a bit. There we go. Now, I'm going to keep stirring right now. I have to be careful because I'm on the clock right now. Meaning that once, once that water, that plaster goes into that water, it is reacting. So we have, we have only a little bit of time to finish our process. So we really have to pay attention and move. I'm going to keep stirring until I get no more chunkies. Right? No more little chunkies of dry plaster. Also, always make sure your cork cans are clean. We use these cork cans for a lot of different things, so there might be a little bit of rubber or silicone or foam on them. Make sure you clean it out really good so none of that can affect the detail of your pattern. Very good. Okay, so you see now, now there's a few tests that I want you to do. Now, I have to hurry up here because remember, I gotta do my piece, but you have the first test of the little Zen Mountain, right? Snowy Peak. Not collapsing, not too much. You don't want a big pile, just a small little mountain like I had. Second one is called the Mickey Mouse hand or the Michael Jackson. Okay, I'm going to insert my hand inside there. And if I, I should just have a nice white hand there with no skin tone showing at all. Okay, if I have any run or, uh, water running off, or it's very watery after I've done a mix and all my chunkies are gone, okay, that means you have to get another handful in there because you don't have enough mix. I'm gonna go ahead and dump my hand inside my water here to get it clean. Okay, make sure you have a little bit of water next to you so you can get that plaster. And now I'm ready to go. Same thing with my wooden spoon. Take it over to my quart can. Make sure that stays wet and rinsed off so it doesn't dry, right, and, and we, we would have to scrape it off. Okay, now. I'm gonna set that to the side gently. Okay, remember, I have to kind of do this all right now because it is curing. Now, next step, I can just pour that on, but I don't wanna do that because remember, I wanna achieve all the detail, okay, that I have. Now, remember about the platelet structure of the clay that we're dealing with infinite amounts of little decks of cards. 
right? Same thing with the plaster here is that there's small little teeny tiny particles of calcium carbonate that I want to make sure it's in every detail. So what the next step is called a splatter coat. So I'm going to do a little bit of dipping here. See that how I just got a little bit, not too much. Okay, not the whole hand, just a bit. And I want you to splatter, almost like you're flicking that plaster into the surface of the clay, right? Okay, and you have to completely do that all over the surface that you want to cast. I'll zoom in here so you really get a sense of what's happening here. Okay, so you see how I have a splatter coat beginning here. Right, I'm not throwing a lot of clay, just small little splats. And that's going to ensure that I have all the detail that's needed. Okay, now remember, I'm not puddling, I'm not dripping, I'm splattering. I don't want puddles, I just want a good, even coat. Okay, I want no clay showing at all, even the fence line. So you're gonna have to like, put maybe put some plastic down or just a nice good piece of plywood or just a old cardboard box or something so you don't get plaster everywhere. But do not worry because plaster comes off of everything. Okay, I'll make sure I spin it as well. See on the other side, aha, I have some hidden spots there. So make sure you are working, remember that word, in the round. Make sure you are working around it, spinning it. Okay. Um, if you have children at home, you can have them step on the clay so you get an imprint of their foot, maybe, with a couple of little geometric and organic shapes to go along with it. You know, there's a lot of things you can do with this assignment here. Now, I don't recommend your child handling plaster because, you know, they certainly like to taste anything that's fluffy and white, you know, because they think it looks like marshmallows or something. So completely understandable, right? <laughs> um, plaster looks very yummy in a lot of different stages. Okay, I'm going to zoom out a little bit so you can kind of see how it's looking. How you see I'm covering everything, making sure I don't add too much, but I'm adding enough. Now, you are going to constantly, okay, or a few times as you are working, stir your plaster because sometimes that plaster can settle to the bottom, okay? But be patient with it, okay? But also be attentive with it because plaster likes you to pay attention to what it's doing, okay? And again, plaster is gonna be uh, what we use quite a bit in a lot of other processes. So again, this assignment is gonna teach us how to mix it properly. Very good. Now you can see how I think I might be done. I'm gonna do some spinning, okay? We've got some time here. The plaster still looks nice and fluid. So see, I'm just dipping small little fingertips in there and just kind of making sure I'm grabbing everything. Okay, now I know you might be thinking, well, why don't I just pour plaster in there? Again, there's a lot of air inside plaster, right? So it will, those air bubbles will stick to that clay, so you'll miss a lot of detail, okay? Remember, the whole point of this assignment is try to get every single thing that, the, that you sculpt onto that cast or into that mold. Remember, M-O-L-D, that's what we're dealing with here is a simple little one-piece mold. Okay, good. Now I'm gonna remember, I'm gonna to continue to get my tool, do some stirring and pay attention to it, okay? Because we don't wanna pour it just yet, okay? Because what's happening right here, right, is that the plaster, I mean, the, the clay here is still very porous, okay? Remember, it hasn't been fired yet, so if I put this clay in water, it's gonna soak up a lot of moisture, right? It's doing the same thing with that plaster right now, is that it's soaking up all that moisture so the plaster on the surface here of your detail is drying slightly differently or faster than the plaster inside your cup so that means is when we're going to wait a little bit until that surface dries just a bit okay you see the time frame here okay so let's start you know right now right one two right so we're going to wait a little bit okay and when i pour you're going to estimate or look at the video and how much time did i spend from the from the splatter coat to the actual pouring of my final thick layer so I have a good cast, right? But I'm still waiting here because I make sure, I wanna make sure that when I pour the rest of my plaster in, I'm not just washing away all that detail. That that detail is, is dry enough that it's going to stay. And you'll see what I'm talking about when I do my pour, that that splatter coat will stay, 
right? And hopefully capturing all detail right, that I want. Okay, almost there. Still gonna spin around and look at it. Okay. Almost. Now it's hard from your point of view here, right? But I'll zoom in. I can notice from my point of view that the glossiness of that plaster is is doling out just a bit, right? Because like I said, it is curing a little faster than what is in your quart cup, right? And you know, a lot of working with material like, you know, plaster is, is, is all these in-between processes that the viewer doesn't really get to see when they see art, right? Um, and there's a lot of good, interesting things that happen with textures and color, right? Um, so always pay attention to what the process uh, does to the material because a lot of ideas and shapes and forms um, can uh, grow out of simple in-between processes. Okay, um, so make sure you look at the video time from the moment that I stop my plaster uh, splatter coat into this next step where I will be pouring my thick coat. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead, see how I've done one more mix with my uh, wooden spoon. Uh, and now what I'm going to do, let me zoom in just back into a, ha a hair, okay, is do my thick coat. Now you're gonna see when I gently pour, right, that the splatter coat will stay, but the thickness will, uh, will, will be there, but it's not gonna wash away. And again, it's because I waited just a bit, okay? Maybe a couple minutes or so, okay? Now we wanna go ahead and pour while this is still uh, fluid enough, okay? Now I'm gonna start slowly, making sure that I'm not moving that splatter coat out of the way, okay? Now what's great about plaster, right, and why the sculptor uses plaster is not only that it can achieve all these shapes, any shape that you pour plaster in, it will get hard, right? But, and detail, that it can capture ultimate fine, fine detail, and I guess we'll see my results. Okay, now you see how I've, I've, I've gone to the top. After you've done that, I want you to just kind of vibrate the table a little bit. Right, just do a little, maybe, bang the table with your knuckle to get any kind of that excess air off. Okay, now that's curing. Now, there you go. You see how I'm, I have my detail coat. I've waited, okay, after my splatter coat. I've covered my clay completely with no clay showing. I've waited, okay, a few minutes, and then I poured my thick coat, making sure that that thick coat doesn't wash over that detail coat. Very good. Yeah, so, okay, now, um, what I want you to pay attention to after you've um, flattened that out and that is sealed is now you're going to have to wait a little bit until the plaster or the rest of the plaster, if you have any in your cup, starts to get a little bit thicker. Now you see how I placed a little um, um, little little pile there of, of curing plaster and you can see how I can start as that cures to add a little bit more and a little bit more. And I really want you to try to play around with this, right? You see how I'm adding just a little by little, okay? Um, because this really shows you the, the, the properties that plaster has that allows the sculptor and the artist to do things with. Uh, it's curing right now because all those small little calcium carbonate particles are exploding. And that's why I want you to, to not just leave your plaster uh, and you know, and you're done for this assignment, I want you to feel it. You can see how my plaster is staying there as I'm still pouring, I'm pausing a little bit, allowing that, allowing that um, plaster to, to, um, to uh, cure, right? But I'm also letting it stack vertically. And that's what's great about plaster is that it's one of the few materials that can do that and also withstand a shape Oop. okay and that's okay i mean let it do its thing but just observe the textures that happens when you just start to pile plaster up like that um and um so i'm going to try to get a little bit more right just just start to stack and play a little bit 
Doesn't matter if it turns out just to be like a flat pancake or whatever. Really just use your hands and get to know the state that plaster goes through while it's um, curing. Because we use each one of these states in sculpture. You can see like right now it's a nice thick paste that can be used to travel vertically to spackle on walls. And that's how the frescoes were made in Mexico City with Diego Rivera and of course with Michelangelo in the Renaissance is with plaster, right? Because that paint would bond onto the, um, the wall that was plaster and cure at the same rate. Um, so, you know, even though that's a real simple shape, right? I've cleaned out my cup here, got everything out. Best way to clean your cup out is to wash it immediately or let this cure completely and it'll crack out by just flexing the, the cup. Okay, so there's a few ways that you can you can use. Now, I want to make sure, remember, if I get any plaster on my hands, that's what my little cup here is for, so I can rinse that off, wipe it down, right? And always make sure that you do have your towel next to you so you can maintain a good clean area, okay? So remember, just any little plaster that you have left over, scrape it off and do a little, just a little blobby sculpture here, again, so you can really uh, uh, feel the way clay is, I mean, the plaster is curing and and getting more and more rigid. Um, you'll see um, some aspects of um, cracking of that platelet structure uh, beginning to um, solidify and cure. Um, and all of that is, is very useful um, to the artist with uh, texture, right? Uh, plastic could be sanded, it could be um, uh, polished with uh, different types of oils. You can make plaster look like anything. Um, so I'm going to make sure that I, again, pay attention to my um, plaster work here on my larger relief piece, okay? Um, and at some point you see how there's still a lot of reflection on mine right now, so it's not ready yet. Uh, the cure time for plaster is a good solid 20 minutes. All right, and that's when it starts to really get hard. If I touch this right now, I have a little bit of water, okay, surface. Let me zoom in a bit. I have a little water surface happening, okay, but it's a little bit thicker. It's almost like a, uh, like a mozzarella cheese right now, so I don't want to do a lot of messing with it, but I am going to go ahead and let that sit and constantly every couple minutes come and touch it. I want you to do that so you can really get a sense of the heat variations that plaster goes through in order to cure. So be patient with it, take a break, come back, touch it, right? And start to analyze the temperature changes and the temperature ranges. Okay, just another uh, update on the status of my plaster. Again, I'm going to touch it and check it again. Now you can see how I don't have that gloss anymore and it's pretty much a, a, a nice matte finish. But if I touch it, Got a little bit of weakness, you can see. Another way of testing it is to get your, either your fingernail or your needle tool, your, I'm sorry, your uh, wire tool, I'm sorry, your uh, wooden knife, and to just kind of tap it, and if it sinks in at all, right, um, you're still not ready. It's still got some time to go, okay? Haven't developed any heat just yet, but it will in a bit. Okay, let's do one more final checkup before um, it's ready to be open. Now I'm touching it right now and it's uh, very warm right now. Um, so I would think about 15 minutes have, has passed by since my last little uh, 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 feel here. Um, again, I'm gonna put my fingernail inside there and it's, it's not giving, right? Nice and hard now or your nice uh, wooden knife here and you can see how, right, nothing's coming off. now. Um, the best thing to do is to wait till it begins to cool from that maximum amount of uh, heat, okay? So it's going to slowly rise, and you're going to keep touching it. Now, when that starts to cool down from its maximum temperature, so let's say you come, it's hot, you come about five minutes later, it's cooler, that means you've gone through the full process and it's ready to go. All else fails, rate, wait at least 25 minutes, and then it should be ready to go. Now, again, that's only if you mix your plaster properly 
right in your cup here. So uh, you do have more plaster. You can do this assignment again. Uh, the issue is, is, that, is your, your clay. So you might have to get a fresh ball of clay. We don't want to use clay that has too much plaster in it. That might have to go into the trash and that's fine in the trash. There's nothing toxic about clay and plaster. Um, okay, so nice and uh, stiff here. Okay, next step, we're gonna open it to see the results of our detail. Okay, now um, I'm pretty much ready to see my results. Um, again, waited my 25 minutes, nice and warm, cooling down, fingernail does not um, uh, give into there. My, again, is nice and solid. And you can see I can probably remove my little sculpture here, right? And that is a nice, um, okay, solid uh, piece of plaster that still has some warmth to it. Um, so I'll just kind of like look at small things like this because, you know, um, you can't sculpt something like that. I mean, this is all about natural movement, uh, more related to uh, geology, honestly, than, um, than um, you know, sculpture because uh, stalactites are formed in caves throughout millions of years the same way with small drops of calcium coming off of those cave walls and slowly building up a, um, a, a, a verticality. Um, but plaster here, I mean, uh, you can see why the Greeks who discovered plaster fell in love with it and the human species in general is because look how it captures light um, um, perfectly on um, the way it kind of gradients into these shadows. So, uh, you know, keep these little um, sculptures here because uh, they could be used for uh, things later on. And remember, you can make more than one. Um, you do have plaster. Um, so just have fun with it, but make sure you do have enough for some of our assignments right here. Um, so just, uh, again, always pay attention to some of the randomness that sculpture uh, creates because a lot of ideas can be formed uh, with very interesting random shapes here. So I'm going to set that to the side, you know, and let's get moving on to opening. Now, the first thing you're going to do is grab a scraper of some sort. Um, you should have something like this laying around the house. And make sure you do a lot of cleanup around the edges first, okay, to get some of the, that debris off because we don't want that to kind of fall in into our detail here. So it's be as clean as possible. I went ahead and did a once over on my table um, to make sure I'm ordered before we go on to the next step. Now, what I want you to do first is just is get the tip of your thumb here and just see you can roll that clay off. That clay should just roll off nicely because remember clay is porous so it's actually uh, sucking the moisture of the clay into the plaster. Plaster is very porous. Um, it's basically a sponge. If I pour a, a little puddle of water in there it'll seep right into that plaster. So the reason why that clay comes off so nicely is because it's sucking the moisture out of that clay. Now this clay here it's not good because it has a lot of plaster in it. We really can't use this to fire. Okay, we want no plaster into any clay that we're going to be firing because plaster, plaster creates uh, cracking and breaking, okay? Um, so all this clay should just go into the regular trash, okay? And it's not gonna hurt anything in the trash. It's definitely organic material. Now you see how I've kind of uh, taken off my um, plaster and I got uh, some interesting forms there uh, from the, um, uh, the, the side of that fence wall. Next step, what I want you to do is to grab a hold of your scraper. Okay, again, we should have something like this hanging around. Um, and maybe even grab your wire tool. And we're gonna try our best to get this off. Now, remember, you gotta be careful with it. I'm just gonna drag that underneath it and just do a little lift here. See if I can let go of a little bit. Okay, lift there. After you do that, okay, okay, you can go ahead and get your wire tool and make sure you don't go upwards you just go okay see how i'm dragging my finger on each side here one down one down making sure i don't scrape or lift that wire onto or to hurt any detail okay so i'll leave that there okay i'm going to turn that around okay set that to the side okay now again um you want to make sure you have everything very orderly. You have, you know, not a lot of debris hanging around, okay? And you can see how I release that. Now, what's, uh, again, what's nice about that clay or that plaster is that plaster is, is, is absorbing that moisture. So you see, I should be able just to gently lift, right? To expose 
the relief. See, I'm just gently lifting. Spinning. And you can see how I'm making sure that that the small little detail don't get chipped or break by aggressively removing that clay. But that clay should just lift off nicely because it's drying a little bit faster due to the porousness of the plaster. Okay, now there we go. Now look at that. I want you to lift it up, take it out into a spotlight or into the sunlight. And I'm going to try to make sure that the camera focuses. There we go. And I want you to see all the detail that you can achieve by properly mixing plaster, which is calcium carbonate, which is a gift from the ancients of a past life form that dominated our world, the shelled creature. And now that shell and all those infinite shells of those life forms are in this calcium carbonate material that we as humans have done so much with throughout the centuries of time. And you can see the effectiveness of that relief. Now, the way you achieve that, again, is that you have that convex shape form with that little inch thick center so you can get that depth. So you can really play with those shadows. And you can see the detail. I mean, it's all there. I mean, that's a 3D printed um, dice there of plastic. And, and if it's focused, you can definitely see every single detail of that. And the seashell, even more complex, captured it perfectly. And not only in its singularity, but in its multiple. So you can imagine this being casted 10 times, right? In, in a square, you can stack this in a wall. Um, so a lot of designers and a lot of sculptors utilize this technique just to see what material does in transforming an object. It's different when you have a shell and then different when you have a shell in another material. Again, this goes to the psych psychology of material and the way the human reacts to material. Um, do not wipe it. Uh, do not try to get any of that uh, staining of the clay that might happen. Keep everything natural because this is still a soft, fragile material. It's still just plaster, right? So it could wash away or you could rub out a lot of that detail. But um, hopefully you've learned how to mix plaster properly. Right? Nice and solid. You've achieved detail and you've had fun. More importantly, you've had fun creating your relief plaster casted right sculpture i really hope everybody had a great time and i do hope you have fun and i do hope you are, are at peace with the processes of making sculpture <laughs>